Welcome to the Sensibly Speaking Podcast. This is Chris Shelton, the critical thinker at large, coming at you for show number 200. Woo! And I am very excited. We are going to jump right into this. Uh, this is brought to you, by the way, on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and with video here on YouTube. Now, I have an amazing and very special guest this week. Of course, all of my guests are special and all of my guests are amazing, but I am very, very, very pumped about this one. Uh, her name is Dr. Marcy Hamilton, and she is the CEO. I'm actually going to read because there's a bit here for you guys to know about her. She is the CEO and academic director at Child USA, which is an interdisciplinary think tank to prevent child abuse and neglect. She's also a widely regarded scholar in constitutional law, which is what we're going to be all about on this one, and a Fox Family Pavilion Distinguished Scholar in the Fox Leadership Program at the University of Pennsylvania. She is an expert on and advocate for the enforcement of the Establishment Clause of the U.S. Constitution. And that should tell you everything about what we're going to be talking about in this episode. And she's also served impressively as a law clerk for Justice Sandra Day O'Connor of the Supreme Court of the U.S., and she has also argued before the Supreme Court. She is um, a, as one example of the kind of thing that she gets herself involved in, she's a critic of the Utah Attorney General's office for not vigorously prosecuting polygamists in the state. Uh, she has indicated that arguments against prosecution based on due process violations and alleged violations of religious freedom had no merit. And she is also the author of three books, God Versus the Gavel, Justice Denied, and fundamentalism, politics, and the law. So, Dr. Hamilton, welcome to my show. Thanks for having me. Yes, I'm very, very happy about this. And I have to ask first off, what motivated you to get, you know, to go all in on the establishment clause as your discipline as a lawyer? Short version is I had a case at the United States Supreme Court uh, challenging the constitutionality of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And uh, there was every reason uh, for me to take the case. It was my very first case I ever had. I just happened to be at the Supreme Court. But I didn't really realize when I took it that I would be up against every organized religion in the United States. And once I found out what it was like to be on the other side of organized religion here, um, I saw the abuses that can happen. And that really... Um, it meant something to me because I'd grown up in an evangelical community as a Presbyterian uh, being told constantly that I was going to hell. So uh, it's, uh, it's been a, a really fascinating ride, uh, but it's been very heartening to be able to work for the vulnerable um, who are being oppressed in religious settings. Awesome. And you, okay, so you grew up in an evangelical household. Do you still hold religious beliefs? So in an evangelical community, my, oh, community. My Sorry. Were, yeah, my parents were Presbyterian, I'm Presbyterian, but uh, we lived in Wheaton, Illinois, which is essentially the, you know, the belt buckle of the Bible Belt. <laughs> right. Okay, good. All right. Well, now, um, I have talked for years about the Church of Scientology and about uh, other destructive cults and about how um, it seems that the First Amendment gives these groups a lot of air cover. Um, it's in a legal in the legal arena. We have freedom of religion, and of course, people should have freedom of religion. I have never advocated otherwise. I want people to be able to believe whatever they want to believe and not be persecuted for those beliefs. My thrust on my channel has always been about what they do with those beliefs, not what's in their head. That all being said, the First Amendment seems to give quite a bit of latitude to what people can do. And I'm wondering, from a legal standpoint, in, in talking to you as a scholar on this exact issue, just how much air cover do these groups get? And by these groups, I mean all religious groups, whether, you know, as officially recognized as such, whether we call them destructive cults or the Catholic Church or the Mormons or the, or the Christians or any of these guys, how much air cover do they get from the First Amendment? 
Well, what's interesting is they don't get a whole lot, but they want you to think that they get a whole lot of coverage. Uh, the First Amendment protects them from being singled out, from being targeted, from being persecuted by the government, and for, from being discriminated against. It does not give them the right to break the laws that apply to everybody else. So they are subject to the child sex abuse laws. They are subject to the cyber stalking laws. Uh, they're subject to contract law. I, I mean, the, we live in an era in which religious groups lobby and argue in the public square that they have unlimited right to do what they choose, but the law simply doesn't agree with them. Interesting. And of course, the first thing that comes to mind, there's two things that come to mind on this. Uh, one, maybe um, that you could uh, elaborate on as to how we might be have some misconceptions about it, and that's the uh, Headley case. That was out of California, I believe. And that, that appeared to be a case where they had come out of the C organization, they had definitely experienced, a, you know, years of uh, physical and emotional abuse, and they were saying, hey, you know, we were trafficked. We, this, is, this was not cool, what was done to us. And it seemed that from the outside, looking in on the reporting that was done on that case, that the, the linchpin, you know, of getting it thrown out was, well, hey, you were part of a religion. You agreed to be part of a religion, and therefore you agreed to all this stuff that we could do to you as part of your religious, you know, the exercise of your religious beliefs. Was that, is that an accurate perception of what happened there? Or what, what do you know about that? Now, I, as I understand that case, what really happened is that the laws that would have been the perfect fit for what Scientology had done wrong weren't part of the lawsuit. Uh, and what often happens in these cases is the lawyers may not understand the fact that they have to avoid talking about religion. They have to avoid talking about faith and beliefs. Instead, they should be focusing on what is the evidence of what this organization has done. And it's the evidence of what it has done that makes it in violation of a numerous laws. And in that case, the court basically did say, um, or the appellate court said, look, if you had brought this um, in uh, with other theories, you might have had a claim, but you didn't and therefore this case is dismissed. In the early days in the clergy sex abuse cases, there was a theory that the lawyers like to use called something like um, a clergy malpractice. And the courts said, oh, we can't decide what clergy should do. And that was the wrong approach for the lawyers. Instead, what they should have been saying is, look at the action th these people took. They violated these contracts, these arrangements, they violated these laws. Um, look what they did. They can believe whatever they want, but they never are allowed to do whatever they want. Right. Interesting. The second case that comes to mind is the one, uh, Luis Garcia's case. Uh, this was, are you familiar at all with this one? I'm not. No. Okay. This was one where he sued the church for, I believe, financial fraud. Uh, they had uh, sold him on donating money to the church for a big cross that was going to be on top of their building down in Clearwater. And, uh, and of course, the big cross is there on the building. But apparently, they sold that cross, or they, they got money for that cross from three different folks with the same story, right? Oh, yeah, if you give us the 20000 we can pay for that cross, right? Something like that. And what, it ended up, what ended up happening, though, is during the course of the... Um, the case, uh, the church brought up contract law. And when you said contract law, that's what immediately came to mind for me is because they said, well, look, you signed these contracts that you would agree to mediation if there was a problem. And the mediation, of course, is the church stacking the deck against anybody bringing a claim against them because they stack it with the mediators are all Scientologists in good standing, which means that they're gonna play ball with what the church wants and what the church tells them to do. The judge ordered, well, you signed a contract, so you're going to have to do this mediation. And it just went, you know, downhill right. from there. Um, and I get the point, you know, that, OK, you signed this contract saying the church could mediate these things. But once you come out of a group like that and you're no longer a Scientologist and you don't want Scientologists mediating your case, do you have any rights at all or are you just totally screwed at that point? Well, it's a tough one.
increasingly there is an argument that contracts like that are against public policy and therefore they should not be enforceable. Uh, there are times when arbitration is appropriate, uh, but there are also plenty of times when it's not. And it's especially inappropriate where the person entered into it not fully capable of fully agreeing if they were a victim of mind control, if they were a victim of a cult. Uh, and there's also reasons to say they shouldn't be subjected to arbitration like that in circumstances where there's been significant harm to them, where they have been sexually abused, where they've been physically assaulted. Um, forcing those kinds of claims into arbitration completely undermines what the legal system is supposed to do for the victims of those activities. Yeah, exactly. How much do you think, you know, one thing that was questioned on that, uh, I think the judges, I think it was Judge Whitmore, I think was the guy's name. And I'm not trying to single him out as having done something right or wrong, because I'm not a lawyer and I don't know. But I'm wondering, do judges, are they fully as versed on this kind of stuff as they should be? You know, judges in the vast majority of cases in the United States are generalists. And um, they tend to be, uh, think they know a lot about the First Amendment and they know about religion. Um, but I think they don't get the full training they need to fully understand two things. One is that religious institutions are perfectly capable of harming people and need to be deterred. They will not stop if there's anything um, the Catholic clergy sex abuse crisis has taught us is that organizations cannot internally fix that kind of harm. It has to be done on the outside. So I think the judges need to learn more about those kinds of cases. But the other thing that judges are not well uh, taught is that the public discourse about religious liberty in this era is extreme. The demands are extreme uh, and they don't actually reflect the law in most circumstances. And so uh, for many of the um, jurists, they're, they're simply putting their thumb on the side of the religion scale when they shouldn't be. Right. Um, do you think, well, I mean, I don't know. I guess it's just psychology, really. Have, let me ask you this. Have you ever run into cases where a judge's bias pro or against religion, I suppose I should ask, uh, was very evident in their decision-making processes? Oh, absolutely. And in okay. fact, um, I was involved in a federal case in which we requested that the judge be recused. In the Seventh Circuit, uh, we had a case involving one of the Catholic bankruptcies, and we had a trial court judge that argued that uh, there was religious liberty rights to completely ban victims from getting any money that was used for cemetery reasons. Uh, this was a ridiculous legal claim, uh, but the judge sided with the church saying that, you know, he had family buried in Catholic cemeteries, so of course it was fine. So we, uh, we succeeded, uh, and we asked that he be recused, and we succeeded in winning the case. But you see it a lot um, in specific states. I mean, there are three states that are still saying that the First Amendment is a defense to child sex abuse cases, and those are Wisconsin, Missouri, and Utah. Um, but the vast majority of the country has come along to the reality that you have to protect the vulnerable even from religious institutions. Yeah, big time, big time. No surprise on Utah, <laughs> by the way. Uh, no, <laughs> yeah. well, and, and frankly, not on Missouri or Wisconsin. Yeah, interesting. It seems like Alabama's in a quick race to get to the head of that line, too. <laughs> well, and Mississippi. Yeah, right. I mean, they, but they don't, they haven't had, they haven't had enough cases that permitted victims to sue because they're all out of statute. Um, so you just don't have that case law. But those are the three states that have continuing case law, putting up the First Amendment as a barrier to justice for people who have been sexually assaulted. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, I'm glad you brought up statute because that triggered a whole other area that I had uh, that I wanted to ask you about, which is this thing that people are endlessly frustrated about in regards to being able to prosecute for assault, emotional distress, you know, false imprisonment, kidnapping, these kind of things, which is this thing called statute of limitations. Um, people grow up in these cults. This is especially difficult for second gen 
second generation members, right? Who, Absolutely. yeah, I mean, we grew, I'm a second generation Scientologist uh, member, right? My, my parents got involved before I did and I was raised in it. And so when you're raised in that paradigm, you, you really don't understand and you're never given the opportunity to have an objective view enough to understand that what's being done to you is not normal. It's not usual. It's right. not what the rest of the world does. Uh, and, it, and there were much worse groups than Scientology when it came to, uh, you know, sexual assault of minors. I mean, I go back to like Children of God and the family and these, you right. know, the, 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 the folks who engaged in 40 fishing and that kind of thing. But statute of limitations always seems to raise itself as this as this like, you know, demon of like, OK, well, there's no justice for you because you it took you 10 years to figure out that you, know, you were part of a group that was extremely abusive to you. So I guess my first question is, one, how much of a bugbear is that for real? And two, uh, is anything being done about it? So the statute of limitations on sex abuse and sex assault have been embarrassingly short in the United States in most of the states until relatively recently. Uh, I was brought into the Catholic cases uh, when the California window in 2003 was opened for the victims at, for the sole purpose of arguing, you know, the um, church state issues. But I said to the lawyers, why is it that, you know, this person can sue, but this person can't? And why is this sister in this lawsuit and this brother in not even though they were both hurt. And the answer was always the statute of limitations. And I just, it just is, a, it's a completely arbitrary deadline. It's got nothing to do with the merits of the case. I literally wrote a book. I had a, a sabbatical at Princeton and I wrote a book called Justice Denied. Um, and the whole point of the book was to explain to the public and the lawmakers that you just have to give victims more time and you need to give them more time because of the trauma uh, they, they are under uh, an incredible power disadvantage in most of these cases. And so we need to open up all these possibilities. And I thought it was such a no-brainer argument that I'd just write a book. Um, it would be published. Everybody would agree. And then I'd go back to doing fancy First Amendment theories. Um, that's not what happened. Uh, what happened is, is that the world uh, came out against statute of limitations reform in the form of the insurance industry, the Catholic bishops, the Baptists. Um, and so uh, we've been working to expand the statute of limitations, especially for sex abuse and assault for, uh, I'd say it's now almost 18 years. And we, this is the year that's a banner year. Uh, we are opening an unbelievable number of opportunities, but we still need to do a better job on the other crimes you talked about on, um, for example, kidnapping, on cyber stalking, on all these other means of oppression where a victim is traumatized and is slowed down in coming forward. Yeah, big time. I, I'm not at all surprised that the, that the machine sort of rose up against you on that uh, particular issue. There is a lot of money and a lot of influence and power uh, you know, represent a lot of secrets. There's a lot, you know, they can all afford this, right? But what they can't afford is the truth. And so they fight tooth and nail to keep the truth from the public. Is it, isn't it somewhat, I mean, I ha I guess I'll ask you on a personal level before, you know, as a believer, as a, you know, it, 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 do you not find that a little disconcerting that these, <laughs> that the organizations of religion, can act as like such, you know, kind of, I, I don't know that monsters is too strong a word in some cases. I'm not trying to paint them all with a black brush. I'm, I'm really not. But man, when they come up with the fangs out and the claws out, it's, it's intimidating. Well, don't, you know, I was raised in Wheaton, Illinois, where um, the evangelicals essentially ran the government and the schools. Um, and so I learned from an early age that it's, perfectly possible for religious organizations to not take into account everybody in front of them. And so when I started to encounter the resistance by religious organizations to being accountable for what they had done, which was so horrific, I guess I just wasn't as surprised as some people would have been. I, I, I wasn't as resistant um, to the reality, but also I was fortunate to be a scholar. I had 
you know, clerked at the Supreme Court and then gone straight into teaching. And I had the luxury to start collecting stories about religious groups that were breaking the law as kind of an, an academic interest. And the more I collected and the more people knew that I was in that space, the more people who had been harmed came to me, the more it was just clear to me that the right religious space for me as a believer was to be up against organized religion when it inappropriately exercised its power. And, uh, and that's what they're doing in this era. And uh, when it comes to the victims, uh, they have to have someone standing up for them. Um, so that's been my career. Awesome. I, I'm curious. I, I have never talked to anybody who has clerked for the Supreme Court before, actually ever been as close to the Supreme Court as you have. I, I, I have so many questions that I'm trying to keep this on, 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 uh, on track here. But what, what is that like? <laughs> Well, it's, first of all, it's like being hit by lightning. Um, there are a lot of talented law students in the country and the justices, you know, they pick who they want to interview. I was very fortunate um, to have uh, been at the University of Pennsylvania Law School and um, Justice O'Connor uh, picked me to be interviewed. Although I'll tell you, I didn't think I was gonna get the job because it was pouring rain that day and it was the day before she had her appendicitis. Oh. So uh, I assume she associated me with people who are drenched. I look like a drowned rat <laughs> right. and really bad pain. But um, we hit it off and I was very fortunate. She, I call her my law mom. She was very, uh, she just took care of me. Awesome. That I, I, It's just such a, I mean, it's kind of the Mount Everest of the legal world to, <laughs> you know, to go argue in front right. of the Supreme Court. Because you not only clerk there, you actually argued a case there. I did. I did. And oddly enough, the first case I ever argued in any court. Um, it was your first I, one? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Talk about nerve. I mean, well, I guess once you've done that, everything else is downhill, right? <laughs> I mean, well, you know, I mean, I clerked there. Uh, I knew every justice from having clerked there not too long before. Um, I, justice O'Connor was still on the bench. Um, it was all very familiar, except honestly, the day that I started to feel some um, stress was the day that all the amicus briefs from all the religious groups against my side came to my house. And when I saw that pile of briefs, that was something. I'll bet, I'll bet. Yeah. 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 Like I said, they're, they're formidable. You know, that's not it, it, yeah, none of none of what's going on right now is are, are these guys' first rodeo. They have been doing this for decades and decades. Yeah, yeah. Well, what and I've been raised to respect religion, uh, and to have my own uh, religion on a brief in opposition to what I was saying. I mean, it gave me pause. Um, but the more bullying I saw, and the more need for them to exert their power, and at some point, one of the uh, a minister said to me, you know, you're not allowed to use the phrase religious lobbyist. I was like, what? Um, that's just a thing. And so I was raised to tell the truth and that's just how it ended up. Well, yeah, I, you're not allowed to use the, like, are we in 1984 now? What are you talking about? I can't yeah. use that term, what? Well, you know, nobody, and, and after I did, I was, I was, I was checked around and nobody else had ever, the, the phrase religious lobbyist was simply verboten. You did not demean religion by saying that what it was doing in the state houses in Congress was lobbying. But I could tell you it was lobbying. And so uh, I had a lot of uh, very quick insight once I won that case. I'll bet. Wow. That must've been really something. Um, okay. I want to get into Scientology, but I guess I want to ask a more general question first about religion in general in the United States. Um, what are the what are the approaches? How do you go on into? I mean, is it just you just kind of take all the belief and religious stuff and you just kind of move it over to the side and you just go in on the actions? Right. Well. For, you start from the law rather than the religion. You know, in the United States, we're very um, prone to making, if there's religion in the picture, we're prone to making it the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. What you have to do is to make the law the center of the universe. And you have to look at what are the elements of the crime or the tort. Look at what it is that they had to have done 
And then you have to match up their actions because if they just talked about it, they have a right to talk about it and they can believe anything they want under the First Amendment. We are, we're uh, the freest country in the world in that the government is not permitted to tell us what to believe ever on anything. So, so you have to be very careful to look for the actions that would have violated the law. You have to focus on the law and then you have to treat it as though you're suing a corporation or you're suing an entity. Um, you're not suing God. It's not God, him or herself. It's not God's you're suing the people who broke the law. And if you can get yourself in that mindset and be thinking on the secular law and the secular terms, it starts to make a lot more sense to everybody. Uh, exactly. I And it makes sense now. Uh, well, it's always made sense. But I mean, I get why they, on the opposition side, would launch what I would call a PR campaign or, you know, oh, yeah. putting out that this is bigotry, this is anti-religion, this is anti-belief, right. they're attacking right. us for our beliefs. So that's, so when you see that kind of thing happening, is that, I mean, could you pretty much say 100% of the time or most of the time that is just them, you know, sort of muddying the waters, the pool, so to speak? Uh, in every case I've been involved in, because I re I'm not going to get involved in a case that involves discrimination. Um, in every case I've been involved in, and that's a lot of them, um, They've just broken the law. And frankly, they're hurting their own religious faith by breaking the law. So they can say whatever they want. They can say, uh, you know, I've been called anti fill in the blank, everybody. Um, it's just not true. I am really opposed to child sex abuse and I'm really opposed to sex assault of adults and really opposed to uh, kidnapping and treating people badly. And the laws don't permit that activity. So it's not anti-Catholic to be actually pro-child sex abuse victim. Uh, so uh, it's just, it's all rhetoric. And it's taken about 20 good years to educate lawmakers and the courts that the claim of religious discrimination is not proof of it. Right, exactly. And there's so much, unfortunately, we are a world of people and people have brains and those brains have biases. And so we, so I, I understand why it takes decades to overcome some of that in the system because 75% uh, of Americans identify as uh, Christian, 25% evangelical. I mean, there's a lot to overcome, a lot of biases and yeah. stuff, you know? Yeah, and there, there's a lot more work left to be done on that. I, I'll tell you that much. Yeah, exactly. Especially, uh, could you speak at all, uh, just since we've, since my channel has touched so much on uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, I mean, the JWs have this two-witness rule, which they've used for years to cover up child sex assaults. The Mormons have used, uh, have actually had it almost part of their dogma that the Elders will meet with these children and quiz them about their masturbatory practices and their sex life, even though they're like 11 or 12 years old. I mean, clearly inappropriate behavior, but it's all under religious freedom. So what about, what about those kind of activities? If they learn about this kind of bad behavior through speaking to a believer directly, they don't have to report it. And they also will refuse to testify to it. So there's been a lot of activity to try to try to keep these practices under wraps. Their problem is the internet. Uh, and the victims who find out that they're not the only ones in the world and then are capable of coming forward. And the more we learn, the more we know uh, about these utterly inappropriate practices and the more we're fighting them. Excellent. Uh, yeah, because it's not, you know, it's not just one group that's like off the rails on this stuff. It's just... Oh, no. You know, and uh, anyway, yeah. I don't want well, to. Let me just tell you about this one uh, in, in Nevada. There was a case at the Nevada Supreme Court in which a woman was raped by her rabbi uh, in order to get access to her uh, congregation for a bar mitzvah for her son. Uh, Supreme Court of Nevada brief is filed by the bishops of the Catholics and the Mormons arguing First Amendment immunity to a case for any religious group involving sex assault or abuse. Uh, now that's the only time they've done it as a joint public effort because I took them to task for it. I thought it was so outrageous. 
Um, but that's what's happening. And that's what's happening behind the scenes. They're fighting together as religious groups to be able to get around the laws that prevent them from doing all of this. Man, and so blatant. I mean, it, you know, because that's public record. Arrogant. I mean, yeah, you know. that's just arrogant. Oh, it, yeah. because, it, I, and, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that literally means that they are claiming that because they are a religion, they should have complete air cover for any child sexual assault and never be taken right. to task for it. Right. What they do is they twist the First Amendment into a pretzel. They wrap themselves in it. And then they say, look at us. We're religious. We're not liable for anything. And sometimes they'll get a judge to fall for it. But over the years, that's gotten harder and harder for them. Over the years, everybody now gets, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, there might be rape in a religious organization. And we better do something about it. <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. Be, uh, yeah. Humans act human. <laughs> you know, what? <laughs> Uh, okay, sure. let's get to Scientology. First off, how familiar are you with the Church of Scientology as an entity? Uh, very. Okay. Um, I, I've been following them for many years. Cool. And um, and full disclosure, you are connected with this uh, recent lawsuit filed by Jane Doe? I am. Uh, yes, I have been brought into these cases. Awesome. I just have one question about that. I don't want to get into when I'm not going to quiz you on specifics of that case or anything, but it is a question I have been asked and I don't have the answer. Why was it filed as Jane Doe when I think everybody kind of knows who it is? Well, you know, when a victim decides to go into court, they never know how they're going to feel about having their name tossed around with all the statements in the complaint, all the facts and all the ugliness. Uh, and so it's just typical to file these lawsuits under a Jane or John Doe to start. And then if they change their mind at that point, that's the point at which uh, you file a motion, you ask for them to be able to be named. So it's really out of respect for the victim uh, and giving them the time they need to kind of adjust to this new air, this new, you know, medium that they're living in. Yeah, I imagine it's um, it, quite uh, <laughs> different air. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it is. It is. Yeah. It's, it's, it's stressful. Uh, nobody uh, who's been a victim of religion should ever be filing any lawsuits without being in therapy because it's hard. Big time. Uh, that I can understand. Um, is there anything that you would that that uh, you've seen on the reporting on this so far? Because it's made international news. I mean, this has been a big deal, and certainly amongst my world in the Scientology watching community, there's all kinds of uh, you know conversation and and hopes and you know various ideas about where it might go and that kind of thing. And it being ongoing litigation and really just having started, I, I, you know, I'm not asking you for predictions. I'm not asking you for anything like that. Uh, is there anything about it that you've seen so far that you thought was inaccurate in the reporting that maybe we should correct the record on? You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I really haven't seen anything that's inaccurate as much as I've seen the statements from Scientology representatives saying that these facts uh, have already been disproved. Um, that's really kind of hard to believe because they haven't been disproved in this case. Um, so part of, the, uh, of dealing with religious groups, it's not just Scientology, but dealing with religious groups in the public square is they come in with a lot of credibility uh, and they frequently start. And if you look, think back to when the clergy sex abuse cases in the Catholic church started, the church and the bishops will say the victims are lying. They're not telling the truth. And why do they say that? Because they don't want the truth to get out there. So I wasn't at all surprised by the Scientologist's response, um, but they have to know we're in a different era. This is not like any lawsuit that they have ever dealt with before. It's harder and harder for these groups to argue either religious liberty or that they stand on the high ground when someone's been really harmed. Boy, I'll say, and having deep, intimate knowledge, there is zero high ground these guys are on at, at all. <laughs> so I will just say that much about it. Um, in looking at legislation, or, you know, in looking at, uh, not legislation, but um, uh, the judicial record, in looking back at, you know, the cases that have been brought against Scientology in the past, uh, Wallersheim, uh, Jerry Armstrong's thing back in the 80s, 
um, the, uh, the Portland case. Um, what do you see, and, and maybe other destructive cults also, when people have kind of gone up against these guys, what do you think has been some of the, the bigger mistakes that have been made along the line, um, and how can we prevent that in the future? Well, I don't know if they were mistakes or if they were victims of their era. Um, there was a time when you couldn't get the judges to listen. Um, and, and there was there was a high level of um, uh, unease and a nervousness by judges because they were hearing things basically for the first time. And they were having a hard time squaring their presumptions of the goodness of religion with the horrible acts they were being told about. So early on in the Catholic sex abuse crisis, you know, judges would deny discovery because they'd say, you know, they, this couldn't have happened. They, they, they didn't believe it or they'd agree to secrecy. Um, that's changed dramatically because we all know what we know now. And um, with the global revelations, the judges are now saying, oh, oh, you say that they have that? Okay. Hey, church, produce it. So we're in a different era. Uh, we have moved from unease and ignorance about the level of wrongdoing by some religious entities to education. And so the judges are in a space now where this kind of complaint is not going to get the back of the hand from the judge automatically. It's going to be read carefully, and there's going to be every reason why we're going to get discovery, because the judge is going to believe that this could be something that a religious group would have. Excellent. It's interesting. I hadn't really, you know, you'd, I guess you'd have to be in a position such as yours or somebody, you know, a real student of this to see the dot connecting that occurs between the various religious groups. I mean, the, the, yeah, the, the Catholic thing blowing open. Uh, I think it was the newspaper reporting that first really blew that thing open. And then suddenly, you know, hundreds, thousands of cases from all over the world pouring in uh, helps the Scientology cases. That's right. But it, it late, but it's it's the Catholics, it's the Jehovah's Witnesses, it's the ultra Orthodox Jews, it's the Orthodox Jews, it's the Mormons, it's the Baptists. I mean, if you look back over the since two thousand two, when the Spotlight Report, when the world was formally introduced to the concept of higher ups in a religious group destroying the lives of children on an organizational basis, we've just had a cascade you know, an increasing waterfall of claims against every church, every religion, every entity, university, schools, boarding schools. Um, we're in the era of disclosure. And it's impossible at this point for a judge to look at a claim like this and to say, ah, you know, that, that's far-fetched. It's the opposite of far-fetched at this point. Yeah, the dam really did break, didn't it? Yeah, finally. But, and, and a lot of that has been due to our success in opening the statute of limitations in many of the states. Uh, we have quite a long way to go. Uh, but uh, this year, we've got 39 states considering uh, extending and eliminating the child sex abuse statutes of limitations and even the adult rape statute of limitations. And so we're just we're in a new it's, it's is, a new game. And that is so encouraging and such good news that this is finally the you know the the avalanche is happening um because you know you know just because we're in a modern era we tend to look back in the past and go oh well you know a different time and all that but you know if it was happening now or 10 years ago or 20 years ago you know this stuff was going on 50 60 100 200 years ago oh, yeah. and there was no yeah. justice for anybody yeah. well you know? in right and in and we now know what's happening in sports um, in the county I live in Pennsylvania, they just named a, a soccer coach who's abused many girls. I mean, it's just, it's everywhere across the culture and religion has lost the ability to say that it is so above or distinct from the culture that it wasn't happening there. Perfect. Exactly. Exactly. Because it's kind of funny how we're all raised with this idea. <laughs> I mean, even me as a Scientologist, you see a guy in a black collar, you know, with the white tab and you just immediately think, Here's somebody I'm supposed to be able to trust. Here's somebody I can trust with anything and everything. 
And we just, you know, with this indoctrination has sort of bypassed the fact that, oh yeah, no, actually the guy in that collar, yeah, he's a human being, <laughs> you know, first, right. Right? right? That is, yeah, yeah. Well, that's my favorite saying, religion would be great, but for the humans involved. Oh. Uh, it, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it, it's the human involvement uh, and their failures that have created these dangers. It's not the religions per se, and it's it's certainly not the fact that people have beliefs. Exactly, and that's been my, I, I completely agree with you. I, I'm 100% on board with that. Um, yeah, religion is neither, <laughs> you know, this this thing that gives you moral high ground, but it's also not something that makes you superhuman. You're, you're just as human right. as everybody else, you know? Right, uh, right. This you, is you just have different kinds of temptations to abuse your power. It's, um, it, it's, it's a wonderful arena to study as an academic because it's all so imaginative. Yes, yes. What I, I ha yeah, I imagine you, uh, you must have thought operating thetans were quite something. Yeah, I mean, you know, after a while, you think you've heard it all, and uh, then, no, you have not. No, nope. there's something else there. That's yeah. right. Okay, well, let me ask, let me let's uh, let's go ahead and move toward wrapping up with this. Um, the future, where do you where do you see this going? And I'm not talking about a prediction on a single case. I mean, in a general sense, you know, you've got statutes now being extended. You've got this work being done. You're clearly not the only torchbearer on this. There are groups. There are, you know, uh, are religious groups actually? Let me ask you this first. Are any religious groups getting on board with this? Uh, no. Okay. No. Um, uh, you know, that, that they, um, they will talk a good game and they will be persuaded to talk a good game. Um, but I think the most instructive moment of, of the recent year on these issues has been uh, when the West Virginia Attorney General files a lawsuit for a violation of fair trade practices against the Catholic bishop in the diocese saying that they lied to the public because they said they had the gold standard for child protection. And in fact, they were harboring pedophiles. That is a brilliant move on the part of that attorney general because that's the problem. They're all now saying, all the religious groups are saying, oh, we, we've got, we're working on it. We're getting procedures. Your child has never been safer than it is now in my institution. Uh, and then the next it gets sexually assaulted and the procedures aren't so great. So um, the future is that the only way to change institutions is to make them accountable. The only thing that makes religious groups uh, accountable is pressure through the law, uh, either through prosecution, criminal prosecution or civil lawsuits. Those are the only two ways that we get any kind of true accountability. As we open up the statutes of limitations across the country, state by state, we are seeing meaningful change. But until we open them up in every state, we won't have the change that we need. But I am extremely encouraged. This has been a banner year for what we call SOL reform, uh, statute of limitations reform. We've seen 39 states considering these laws and already 20 have passed something. So the future is accountability. Uh, and um, one of my goals right now is to persuade the insurance industry, they ought to be on our side. They should not be on the side of the bishops and, and the religious groups who are trying to cover this all up. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to be on the wrong side of history on this one. No, no, not when there's children and, and, and women and I mean, even men. I mean, it's just, it, you know, there will be a, oh, there will yeah. be a gradual, you know, it'll start with the children, then it'll go to the women, then it'll go to everybody. And, the, you know, the, somehow I, I think accountability, like you just said, is the key because, um, you know, sending these people a strongly worded letter ain't where we're at anymore. You know? No, no. Well, a strongly worded letter to a bishop uh, or to uh, David Miscavige does nothing but reinforce them that they have the power to do what they want to do. Uh, but a lawsuit makes them produce records and makes them be accountable and brings them to account. That's, that's the only way here in the United States we hold people to account, but it's really powerful. Big time. Excellent. Well, I cannot uh, actually literally thank you enough for the work that you are doing and have done because, uh, you know, our, we're, we have common cause. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you again for being part of my show here and, and my 200th episode, no less. <laughs> right. Anytime. Awesome, Marcy. All right, uh, folks out there, I hope that you found this uh, informative, educational, and interesting, uh, and maybe a slightly entertaining as well. Leave any questions, <laughs> comments, or feedback in the comment section below here on YouTube or at sensiblyspeaking.com. And um, who knows, maybe if, uh, if a whole new, a whole other avenue uh, opens up here, then we will do uh, another show at some point in the future with uh, with. Marcy here, because uh, clearly she knows what she's talking about. <laughs> All right, guys, see you next week. Bye-bye.